Hello and welcome. I am the Armchair Audiophile, and today we're going to be doing a long-term update on the Hi-B R5. Now, I've been using this player for a few months. I've obviously had the KN N5 II for several years, and I want to talk about this. Now, I'm going to break this down into good points and bad points. We're going to keep it pretty quick, pretty informal here. The good points, first and foremost, resolution and tonality. The resolution on here is excellent. In the unboxing video, I said that it was about on par with the KNN 5.2, but after listening for a little while, I think that it's probably a little bit better. Like, a, a little bit, not a ton, but it is a dual DAC implementation, and it's a newer chip, and I, I think you can hear that. The uh, tonality, I said, was cooler, and a little bit more analytical, and that has bared true. I, I've tested it out with so many headphones um, back and forth between them, and it, pretty consistently it is a little less warm than the N5 II, and it has slightly better micro detail retrieval. And frankly, I don't think either one of those is a bad thing. I'm not trying to say that the N5 II is a, uh, you know, has poor resolution, it just is slightly outclassed by a slightly newer player. As for the tonality, you might want warmer, but I think as a reference tool for doing reviews, the R5 is a little bit up my alley in that respect. Now, driving power is the second big plus on this. Uh, as we talked about in the unboxing, power here is just off the charts. Single-ended is a little over 200 milliwatts, beating out the 120 or so of the KN. Balanced is a full watt per channel at 16 ohms versus about 250 milliwatts on the KN. I've played around a lot with both. The single-ended output is pretty good. I was testing with the Odyssey LCD-1, and frankly, it didn't really have the juice single-ended to bring out the full bass extension, and uh, that became really apparent when I plugged this thing into the iFi X can and without any sort of X bass or, or additional uh, bass boost, the, the bass performance really stepped up a notch. And uh, so I think that the single ended output is still not quite up to the task of a full size planar. However, the balanced output is ridiculous. I've been playing around with it with the 10 Hi Fi P1, with the Shure tape but also with my Dan Clark audio now, I was gonna say Mr. Speakers, but the Ether C Flow. Now, that's a headphone I've had for a while, I've spent a lot of time with it, and I can tell when it's not running at full dynamic potential. Now, I'm not gonna say that this thing runs it to full dynamic potential per se, but, but, it is good enough that I can enjoy it without feeling like I am wasting a play of the song. Uh, I don't know how many of you can relate to this, but, I don't like to listen to a song on a system or on a set of headphones where it feels like I'm missing something because you can only really listen to a song so many times before it starts to get old. You start to get sort of brain burnout on it. Uh, so I really try to limit my favorite tracks to ideal circumstances. And this high BR5 right here does a really admirable job powering the Ether C Flow balanced. You know, I, I've been able to sit in bed with nothing but this player and listen to my Ether C flows. Um, it doesn't scale them to full potential. It doesn't have quite the meat and gusto of my desktop rig. However, it is more than adequate for an enjoyable listening session, and that is incredible for a handheld player. Third, dual lineouts. Both the single ended and the balanced output on this have full headphone circuitry bypassing line out functionality. This has also been incredible. I was able to get a 4.4 millimeter to two and a half millimeter cable, run the balanced output to the iFi X can and use that to run literally anything. It's really dope to be able to get a balanced source for this price, which if I recall correctly is $399. In addition, I was confused at first to discover that the volume control still worked in line out mode. And I thought that might be an indication that it wasn't a true line out, you know, it wasn't bypassing the headphone circuitry. So I reached out to a representative of Hybe on HeadFi and they clarified that the DAC chips themselves support volume control. So while it would be ideal to use it at full volume to get a full two volt fixed line out, 
if for any reason you're overdriving your amplifier, you know, maybe you're running it in the car and your car's input can't quite take it, being able to lower the line out volume is pretty useful. Not something I'm gonna use very often, but why restrict features if you don't have to? Fourth, the software experience and touch response. The Can N52 is very good. It uses a modified version of hi Music as kind of its whole OS with very limited access to further Android apps. And having only one gig of RAM and using a sort of no-name rock chip uh, system on chip, it can get a little bit choppy. Sometimes scrolling isn't particularly smooth, especially if you're running like a DSD track, it can start to get overwhelmed. I didn't have any of those issues with the R5. The Snapdragon 425 and two gigs of RAM results in a very smooth experience from a software perspective, and uh, that's been really refreshing. Additionally, I, I talked about touch responsiveness in the unboxing, and I said I thought that might be related to the screen protector. I did eventually pull that garbage screen protector off of this thing and that remedied the problem immediately. The plasticky screen protector it comes with is garbage, definitely remove it. Uh, that's all I can really say, just remove it because it, uh, the screen protector that comes with it out of the box absolutely interferes with touch responsiveness in a way that makes it feel 10 years older than it is. Fifth, software support. Since I got this player, there have been something like, you know, six, seven, eight updates, uh, one of which actually added MQA support, which was awesome to get as an OTA update. And I know that's going to be huge for those of you out there who are using Title Masters. I don't personally subscribe to any music streaming service because I prefer to collect my music in a, uh, you know, in an offline way and have it forever. So streaming services aren't really my jam, but I did purchase Anderson Pox Ventura record on Pro Studio Masters in MQA to test this feature. It does work. It sounds great. And uh, not much more to say about that. That's an awesome feature. It's 2020. That's something I want to see on most players and DAX above, say, 200, 250 bucks these days. Finally, this is going to be a really specific example, but I have a DSD cut of Shine On You Crazy Diamond by Pink Floyd, and the file is 550 megabytes. The KNN52 only has one gig of RAM, and I don't think I've ever been able to get through that full track without the OS crashing. It's just too much. I mean, to run the OS and to store the track, it doesn't have enough RAM. The two gigs of RAM in the R5 avoid that problem completely, and I'm able to go all the way through the track without any crashing of the OS, which is obviously preferable. So overall, summing it up, I love the resolution. I like the neutral tonality. Driving power is ridiculous. Dual line outs is amazing, particularly because it's a true dual DAC architecture. So you're getting a true balanced source, which is excellent for the money. Software experience is excellent compared to a slightly older player. Uh, software support has been great on the part of hi -B. I know there were some issues with that on the R3, and it's nice to see that they've listened and sort of avoided that same mistake with this player. And uh, just being able to play the largest, stupidest DSD files that you possibly have is a big advantage over the N5 too. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's talk about the bad stuff. I don't have a ton of bad stuff to talk about here, but there are a few little points I'd like to make. The first is that this thing runs hot when you're using the balanced output. You know, not hot enough to burn you or anything like that, not hot enough to cause any physical damage to the unit that's apparent, but hot enough that I would be concerned about longevity if I was going to use this for several hours a day. Um, typically, my listening sessions don't go longer than an hour, hour and a half. So for me, this hasn't been a huge issue, but I think if you're the type of person who's gonna use one of these players all day long at work or in the car, and you plan to run balanced, this might not be your player because I think that, you know, five to six hours a day at that kind of heat is gonna compromise battery life long term, and there doesn't appear to be any non destructive way into the device to replace the battery like you can on the KN with its, uh, you know, screw attached backing plate. Uh, frankly, this is enough of an issue that I would probably accept a software update cutting that one watt down to 800 milliwatts if possible, if it made a meaningful difference to thermal performance to extend the life of the player. The second bad point 
is distortion with EQ. So one of the things people really seem to like about Hybe Music is that uh, between MSEB and the EQ functions, you get a lot of tweakability. Now, I'm a bit of a curmudgeon for software-based EQ overall, and I have my reasons for that, but I felt the need to test it for this review. I did that with the LCD-1, and even running it through a separate amplifier, so I knew that it wasn't a power issue, dialing in just about you know a decibel and a half at 30 hertz and a decibel at 60 was enough to generate audible distortion in the bass. And uh, the LCD-1 measures damn near zero, you know, zero distortion. So I know it's coming from here. I don't know if that's a software issue, if that's a hardware bottleneck or what's going on, but I wasn't able to play with EQ much at all without introducing significant distortion that really bothered me. And the same can be said for MSEB. Uh, I played with it a bit and I really didn't get any results that I felt compelled to listen with. So if you're going to be doing a lot of tweaking, I don't think this is your player. For comparison, the N5-2 I use with my Odyssey iSign 20s, and I have an EQ curve that I got from a user on HeadFi, and it's a really extreme EQ curve, like really wild all the way across the frequency range to try and simulate the Odyssey cipher cable. And I can run that on the KN without any noticeably added distortion, and this is a less powerful system on chip with half the RAM. So I don't know what's going on there, but I did not have a good experience with EQ on the high BR5. Finally, and this is a little bit of a nitpick, the design is just uninspired. There's, there's nothing meaningful or interesting about the design of this player. You know, that's me kind of bitching a little bit about something that doesn't matter a whole lot. However, you know, the N5-2 is a work of beauty. The, the, the way they've surfaced the metal, the chamfered edges, the volume knob up in the corner, this wonderful pattern on the back, the you know silver script KN logo, it's overall just a way better looking player, and uh, I appreciate good design. I, I don't know what else to say. It is a little bit disappointing to me that at four hundred dollars they didn't take a little bit more time to consider the style of the player. So. These are my thoughts on the High BR5 after a few months of use. Overall, I still recommend it unless you're going to use the balanced output for several hours a day, or you really, really want to use EQ on a regular basis. Those would be, I think, the two disqualifying use cases for this player. With that, I'd like to invite you back to the channel soon. I've got a uh, unboxing and first impressions of the TFC T2 Galaxy that is going up probably at the same time as this video. Check that out. I've got the Schuer Singer coming in tomorrow, and I'm going to try to get a first impressions of that out within the next couple of days. Uh, I still want to do the Galaxy Buds. I've got a deep dive on the LCD one coming, and we have a Patreon now. The Patreon has three tiers. 5 10 and $25. We have a private Discord server for Patreon supporters where I'm going to be active. You can ask me questions, see what I'm working on in real time. And at that $25 tier, currently limited to five patrons, you have the right to have me say anything you'd like at the end of my videos with a few common sense qualifiers which are listed on the Patreon page. So please, if you like the channel and you want to support it and you'd like to see, you know, more high-end stuff and more frequent videos, go ahead and check the Patreon out. I would really appreciate it, and I can't wait to see you guys in the Discord. That's it for me, the Armchair Audiophile, reminding you that life is too short for bad headphones.